For generations, people have wondered about the Earth. How has this ancient cave-riddled landscape changed the very air we breathe? Are these stepping stones on a sunny beach, or living organisms that date back to the dawn of time? What role will these modern sea creatures play in shaping the future of the Earth? Join us in a search for ancient forms of life that have transformed our oceans and our atmosphere. Today, their descendants are still helping to maintain the Earth's temperate equilibrium. Life from the sea, this time on the Miracle Planet. Here at the Pacific Coast, it's easy to feel the vastness of the oceans that cover more than 70% of the planet's surface. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis for the Miracle Planet. We know of no other place in the universe where large seas of liquid water exist, where mild temperatures prevail and life abounds. How did the Earth develop into a temperate, life-sustaining world? Living creatures have played a crucial role in the process by altering the balance of important elements like oxygen and carbon dioxide. In fact, life itself has helped create the conditions for its own success. It all began out there, in the ocean. Traces of the earliest life on Earth can be found today in Shark Bay on the west coast of Australia. Far inside the shallow bay is a lagoon known as Hamlin Pool. This placid shoreline is studded with strange formations. Called stromatolites after the Greek translation for bed of rocks, they are actually built by colonies of microscopic organisms. These stromatolites are the rocky homes of those creatures. The organisms need sunlight to live and spread out in the crystal clear shallows of the Australian coast. Because of its remote, salty nature, Hamlin Pool provides a nearly ideal situation for these microscopic creatures. In this shallow haven, they are largely free of predators. Here they flourish the descendants of ancient organisms, building up their pedestals of rock. Hamlin Pool provides a glimpse of what the shallow seas of our world might have looked like more than three billion years ago. In these waters, the ancient process of forming stromatolites is still going on today. The surface of the rock appears soft and slimy. The bubbles are oxygen given off by tiny creatures. The yellow-green tint is chlorophyll, essential for the most common form of photosynthesis in plants. The surface of these stromatolites is actually covered by one of the Earth's most primitive forms of life. Magnified many times, this is blue-green algae, or cyanobacteria, as they are called today. Like their more highly developed relatives, the green plants, cyanobacteria produce oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis. 
Further magnification of the bacteria reveals their long, thin cell, covered by a sheath. Because it's rather sticky, the sheath collects grains of sand and other minute bits of debris. In stromatolite construction, the stickiness is the mortar and the sand is the masonry. On the seashore, the natural habitat of cyanobacteria, the waves are constantly stirring up the sand. This incessant action of wave and wind provides a virtually endless store of raw materials for the stromatolite builders. The stromatolites are formed bit by bit over an extended period. Some are the work of hundreds of thousands of years. Every day when the sun beats down on the cyanobacteria, the cycle of growth continues. Using photosynthesis, they grow by converting sunlight and carbon dioxide into food and oxygen. The wave action of the ocean deposits fine grains of sand on the surface of the stromatolites. At night, the cyanobacteria secrete calcium carbonate, which cements the mud and sand. Then, in the light of a new day, photosynthesis begins again and the cyanobacteria continue the ancient cycle. The rate of growth is slow, a tiny fraction of an inch per year, but repeated over countless days and nights, this process can create large, stony colonies. Over an extended period of time, it can produce huge rock formations. The cyanobacteria that built these rocky stromatolites are a very simple and ancient life form. They appeared on Earth billions of years ago and have remained largely unchanged in nature and habit. Yet despite their antiquity, they are by no means the oldest form of life on Earth. In recent years, scientists have found evidence of even older organisms that make these stromatolites look complex by comparison. In the search for traces of ancient life, an exciting discovery was made here, near a blazing spot in the desert that the Australians ironically call North Pole. In 1976, in what appears to be very ordinary rock, scientists discovered the oldest known fossil creatures. They dated the sample at 3.5 billion years old. One of the paleontologists who discovered the North Pole fossil is Dr. Malcolm Walter of Australia's Bureau of Mineral Resources. This is what one form of life on Earth looked like 3.5 billion years ago. These two linked spheres are believed to be a primitive bacteria-like creature immediately after cell division. Is this the first life on Earth? Based on his examination of the fossil bacteria found at North Pole, Dr. Walter does not think so. The first thing they tell us is that even 3.5 billion years ago, life was quite complex, even though the organisms we consider were only bacteria. They were quite complicated sorts of bacteria and many different types of bacteria as well. So we can suggest that the origin of life must have been some long time before 3.5 billion years ago. That was a surprise to discover how complex these organisms were at that time. 
The discovery of a complex bacteria-like creature dating back three and a half billion years was in itself a major find. But there was another discovery at North Pole, Australia. These stromatolites were discovered in the same strata as the oldest fossil. The original shapes have been distorted over time, but here is proof that stromatolites like the ones in Hamlin Pool were being formed at the same time as the earliest known life on Earth. Ancient colonies of cyanobacteria, the organisms that built these rocky forms, were photosynthesizing, producing oxygen, and changing the environment of the world more than three billion years ago. The dramatic discoveries at North Pole, Australia, have underscored the great antiquity of life. Since the oldest known life forms seem relatively complex, it's likely that even more primitive forms preceded them. Life may be far older than the oldest fossil records. Little evidence remains from the early years of Earth's development. Scientific theories disagree about the exact nature of our primordial planet, but one thing is certain. The world was very different then from what it is today. The newborn Earth was a dim world where the sun shone much less intensely than now. Meteorites plunged continually through the primeval atmosphere. The meteorite impacts heated the planet's surface, causing the release of water vapor and other gases. During this period, the same world forming process was also taking place on Venus. But on Venus, the clouds of carbon dioxide and water vapor built up into a thick layer, trapping tremendous heat close to the planet's surface. Because Earth was farther from the sun, it continued to cool. The atmosphere surrounding the Earth reached a crucial point. Instead of growing thicker, the clouds would release their store of moisture. For the first time on Earth, rain began to fall and continued to fall as our world slowly cooled. For millions of years, the water poured down, covering the Earth with great oceans. Much of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere dissolved in the oceans, preparing the way for life to develop. To find out what life may have been like at the dawn of time, we must return to the sea again. During the 1970s and 80s, scientists in research submarines were diving off the Pacific coast of North America, from Canada to Mexico, to depths of nearly 9,000 feet. On the ocean floor, they discovered an unexpected form of geothermal activity. Called black smokers, these vents actually discharge superheated water, highly acidic and laden with dissolved minerals. Even more surprising than the smokers themselves was the discovery that these areas are tremendously rich in bacteria. These primitive creatures survive without oxygen or light from the sun. Instead, they derive their energy from the mineral-rich water. The conditions here seem incredibly hostile to life as we know it. Yet the earliest forms of life on our planet may have flourished in such an environment. On land, too, we can still find the conditions that may have supported early life. The Yellowstone National Park is the site of some of the world's most distinctive geothermal displays. Originally created by a series of volcanic eruptions, the area is still active. Today, the two million acre national park 
contains more than 200 geysers and 10,000 hot springs. One of the gems of Yellowstone is the Grand Prismatic Spring. Almost 100 yards in diameter, its brilliant color is the result of minerals dissolved in the water. Yellowstone's geysers reach as high as 300 feet. The best known geyser is Old Faithful, which erupts once every hour. In some locations, hot water carries dissolved minerals up to the surface of the earth. Calcium carbonate and other compounds precipitate out. The result is the formation of natural terraces. This is Minerva Terrace. At Yellowstone, a primordial quality permeates even the streams and waterways. Hot water pools are the home of strange growths, reminiscent of a more ancient time. Paint pots and mud volcanoes bubble at almost 200 degrees. The boiling temperature is only one of the inhospitable aspects of this volcanic water. It's also highly acidic. Splash a little on your clothing and the fabric would char immediately. Almost 200 degrees Fahrenheit, pH factor one, and no free oxygen. Conditions like these were common on our primordial Earth. They seem impossibly hostile for life, yet sulfur bacteria thrive here. They're anaerobic bacteria, able to survive without oxygen. Now, sulfur bacteria can only exist in restricted environments, hostile to most other organisms. The anaerobic bacteria have an irregular cell wall and contain no nucleus, both indications of its primeval heritage. This is one scenario of how simple anaerobic bacteria may have changed our primordial world. For the earliest forms of life, the absence of oxygen and high temperatures appear to have been the norm. Oxygen was almost certainly lethal to the first living things on Earth, just as its absence is lethal to animal life on the planet today. Then came a crucial turning point. New organisms developed which began to produce oxygen as a byproduct of their more complex respiratory process. As this oxygen continued to build up in the water and atmosphere, it changed the nature of the world. The older anaerobic organisms were either killed by contact with the oxygen or forced into specialized environments. In time, the older organisms only survived in a few environmental niches, while the newer oxygen-producing organisms, such as cyanobacteria, began to dominate the Earth. At Great Slave Lake in northwestern Canada, there are more signs of that bygone age when primitive life forms produced oxygen in enormous quantities. The rocky shoreline has an unusual pattern. These formations were built up over a long period of time, layer upon layer, slowly and steadily. In fact, these fossils are ancient stromatolites built by cyanobacteria. These formations are similar to those discovered in Hamlin Pool and at North Pole, Australia, where the fossils date back about three and a half billion years. 
These rocks are only two billion years old. But what is surprising about the Great Slave Lake stromatolites is their enormous quantity. Rising steeply from the bottom of the lake, this cliff has been built up from layer upon layer of stromatolites. The cliff extends for 60 miles along the shoreline. The stromatolite layers are nearly 100 feet thick, indicating that they were active for a very long time. Two and a half billion years ago, life on Earth was already producing a great deal of oxygen. When the Great Slave Lake was a shallow sea covered with stromatolite colonies, there was enough oxygen in the atmosphere to support life on land. But the mixture of gases in the air was not the same as in the air we breathe today. Oxygen was less plentiful, and carbon dioxide was much more common. For our modern atmosphere to develop, a great deal more carbon dioxide had to be removed from the atmosphere. One place where we can see this part of the Earth's ancient atmosphere literally turned to stone is China. It's dawn in Guilin. This rugged South Chinese landscape has long inspired artists and poets. It was written of the Guilin region in an ancient poem. The fantastic peaks grow like a jasper forest. The blue waters ripple like silken gauze. These strangely evocative hills run for over 60 miles on both sides of the banks of the Lijiang River. From a distance, the peaks have a misty, dreamlike quality, which is underscored by names like Peak of the Bright Moon and Peak of Solitary Beauty. But on closer inspection, it's clear the hills are composed of rugged, shell-colored rock. The layers run horizontally, with crevices across them. These are the special characteristics of limestone, one of our world's most common types of rock. Limestone is our clue to how the Earth's atmospheric carbon dioxide has remained at relatively low levels. High-quality limestone, suitable for making cement, is quarried here in Guilin. At one corner of the quarry, a small experiment was conducted. When hydrochloric acid is poured over crushed limestone, a violent reaction takes place. A gas is produced that begins to fill the plastic bag. The gas is carbon dioxide. When the carbon dioxide is poured over the candles, it displaces the oxygen and smothers the flames. For millions of years, carbon dioxide has been locked in the hills of Guilin and the world's other limestone formations. Little carbon dioxide remains free in the Earth's atmosphere, but it still has an important effect on the world's climate. This is one of the best places to measure the Earth's atmospheric makeup because it's far from the pollution of any large city. 
The observatory is located near the top of Mauna Loa on the island of Hawaii. Here, scientists have observed small changes in the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere for over 30 years. Carbon dioxide makes up only a small fraction of our modern atmosphere, but even tiny changes in its concentration can affect the temperature of the entire planet. The amount of carbon dioxide in the air has been increasing ever since observations began in 1958. Presently, it reaches almost 350 parts per million. This upward trend could have a dramatic effect on our world's temperate climate. Carbon dioxide does not create heat, but it does help trap it. Solar radiation warms the Earth's surface but very little is absorbed in the atmosphere. The heat is returned to space in the form of infrared radiation emitted by the Earth. Carbon dioxide acts like a blanket, trapping the infrared radiation and causing the climate to warm. This is the greenhouse effect. As the level of atmospheric carbon dioxide rises, so does the temperature. If the gas continues to increase at its present rate, there is growing concern that the average temperature of the Earth could rise 4 to 8 degrees Fahrenheit by the middle of the 21st century. One devastating result of the global warming might be widespread flooding of highly populated coastal areas like New York City. Based on one theoretical projection, the sea level could eventually rise enough to flood the streets of Manhattan as ice melted from the polar regions. The Earth's environment could change dramatically based on only a slight change in atmospheric carbon dioxide. The delicate balance of our temperate environment has been maintained in part by the hills of Guilin and many other extensive limestone formations throughout the world. Massive quantities of atmospheric carbon dioxide have been transformed into limestone. A clue to this extraordinary process that created the Earth's modern atmosphere is etched in the face of these hills. The skeletons of ancient corals and other sea creatures are packed closely on the surface. These are the fossilized remains of an extinct organism known as stromatoporoids. They once lived at the bottom of an ancient ocean along with corals and other marine creatures. Their remains are evidence that this land was once under the sea. It was in an ancient ocean that carbon dioxide was transformed into massive flat beds of limestone. Later, through an unusual process of erosion, the limestone would evolve into Guilin's unique topography. This region of limestone hills studded with the fossils of ancient marine creatures, spreads over a large area. In a satellite image of China, the scope of the limestone regions can be seen. When the Guilin area is enlarged, it appears to be mottled with tiny dots. Each dot is the shadow of a limestone peak. Some are several thousand feet high. Extensive limestone regions can be found throughout China accounting for nearly a quarter of its entire territory. Limestone is particularly concentrated between southwestern China and the Tibetan highlands. At Shalin, 600 miles from Guilin, thousands of fantastic stone towers cover the landscape. Many reach 100 feet in height.
These deeply sculpted towers are the result of natural forces. The limestone at Shalin was formed in the sea about 300 million years ago. It was laid down as a thick, flat layer. Since then, recurring rains have carved the unusual shapes through erosion. Small differences in the climate or in the amount of calcium carbonate in limestone can produce entirely different landscapes. Here, the results have been exceptional. But whatever form it takes, limestone can be found in great quantities throughout the world. Limestone is so common on our planet that it's easy to overlook just how remarkable it is. Ocean-dwelling creatures have formed most of the limestone on Earth. Such large-scale deposits on our planet are believed to be unique in the solar system. The four inner planets of our solar system share a common ancestry. They are all rocky worlds and relatively small compared to the gassy outer planets yet each is much different from its neighbors. Venus provides an example of what the Earth might have looked like if much of our planet's atmospheric carbon dioxide had not been changed into limestone. Venus is similar in size to Earth, but its atmosphere contains 200,000 times as much carbon dioxide as our world today. A runaway greenhouse effect caused by a thick blanket of carbon dioxide keeps the planet from cooling down. The surface temperature is hot enough to melt lead. It appears that life as we know it didn't have a chance to develop on Venus. Without oceans and living organisms, Venus could not develop a temperate atmosphere by transforming carbon dioxide into limestone. Because of the greenhouse effect, Venus will remain a hot, dry, and barren world. Our world is a blue oasis compared to Venus. At the time of our planet's formation, the newly developing oceans absorbed an enormous amount of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Much of this carbon dioxide later formed into limestone through pure chemical reactions. The work of making limestone was then taken up by living creatures, a myriad of minute organisms born in the oceans. Even today, marine creatures continue the process. Limestone is still being formed in the oceans of our world, but nowhere is it more evident than here off the coast of Australia. This is the Great Barrier Reef, the world's largest coral formation. In this protected environment, sheltered by vast formations of coral, life is wonderfully abundant and complex. Large groupers share the clear waters with schools of smaller fish. A 
A balanced ecosystem is maintained by living creatures as they cooperate, compete and prey on one another. The reef itself is a gigantic mass of limestone. It is continually being formed as carbon dioxide is dissolved in the ocean and transformed by the coral into delicate shapes and massive forms. A coral reef like this is actually a colony of innumerable coralites or separate minute organisms. Each coralite builds a protective limestone skeleton. In the daylight, coral doesn't look much like a colony of living creatures, but in the darkness of night, the coral comes alive. Now the surface of the colony, which looked like a barren rock during the day, begins to pulsate with white waves. Polyps emerge from minute recesses and start to seek food with outstretched arms. When one encounters its prey, tentacles contract to capture it. The process of making limestone begins with the coral eggs. From October through November, the spring months in the southern hemisphere, coral organisms from the Great Barrier Reef lay their eggs. Egg laying continues for a week after the full moon of October and November, as if synchronized with the lunar rhythm. The eggs are fertilized and become larvae less than a sixteenth of an inch in length. Each one has the potential of growing an outer skeleton of limestone, but at this stage they are defenseless against predators. Only a few weeks after fertilization, the larvae seek a new home, attaching themselves to the hard surface of rock or other coral. Nearly two days are needed to build their protective covering. Time-lapse photography speeds up the process. Sinews full of white particles begin to extend radially. These are crystals of calcium carbonate made from carbon dioxide and the calcium dissolved in the seawater. This is the coral's protective skeleton and the basis of the limestone reefs. Viewed from another angle after 48 hours, the growth of the limestone is clearly evident 
as the coral begins to build its home. In making their massive limestone colonies, coral polyps also reproduce by a process known as budding off. The new polyp appears next to an existing one and builds its own skeleton. As the process continues over and over again, the coral structure grows upwards and sideways. Beneath the surface of living coral, limestone rock is slowly forming. As the coralites build their limestone skeletons, carbon dioxide is removed from the seawater. It is replaced by additional atmospheric carbon dioxide that dissolves into the ocean. A coral reef develops very slowly, absorbing carbon dioxide as it grows. The reef is formed by countless individual coral polyps. Each polyp is tiny, but if the process continues for 8,000 years, the result can be enormous reefs of limestone. The Great Barrier Reef covers an area of 80,000 square miles and protects Australia's northeast coast from the full force of the sea. But this massive limestone formation is not the only great reef in Australia's geologic past. In the northwest region, far inland from the present shoreline, there is evidence of a similar fossil reef built by marine life long ago. Here, rocky limestone cliffs extend far over the arid plain. They are 250 feet high and rise steeply from the level ground. These cliffs were once ocean reefs, made of the limestone skeletons of minute sea creatures. Today, water is scarce in northwestern Australia, but long ago this arid land was at the bottom of an ancient ocean. This desert range was once a massive reef extending over 600 miles. Viewed from the air, it resembles the modern Great Barrier Reef in both shape and scope. The oldest known limestone was formed by living creatures about three and a half billion years ago. It was then that stromatolites started to form limestone by slowly building up grains of sand into pedestals of rock. Since then, a succession of living creatures with calcium carbonate skeletons have evolved including the coral polyps that continue to build today's Great Barrier Reef. Almost all of the limestone on Earth is composed of their remains. In this way, 
life itself has locked up vast amounts of carbon dioxide in the rocks. Each limestone cliff and formation is an indication that once there was more carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere than there is today. Throughout the world, limestone deposits are monumental storehouses of carbon dioxide, once present in our planet's atmosphere. Below the oceans, living factories are constantly manufacturing more limestone out of calcium and carbon dioxide dissolved in the water. The rock-forming creatures may take many exotic shapes, like the twisted contours of this brain coral. Together with many other marine organisms, they continue the ancient, life-sustaining process that keeps our world temperate. In Guilin, another aspect of the ongoing nature of that process is evident. Water plays the critical role in maintaining the delicate balance of our atmosphere. Underground rivers are common around Guilin. They eat away at these soft limestone hills, dissolving the rock and returning carbon dioxide and calcium back into the water and eventually to the atmosphere. In the labyrinth of caves around Guilin, we can see the process continuing today. The sculptured ceiling of this huge cavern is 230 feet high. The cave is being hollowed out as the action of the water dissolves the limestone walls. At the same time, strange subterranean formations are taking shape. When the carbon dioxide in the subterranean water combines with calcium ions, it becomes pure calcium carbonate. caves, the calcium carbonate sometimes solidifies into stalactites. Growing less than a sixteenth of an inch a year, these stalactites are already tens of thousands of years old. In a never-ending cycle, water dissolves the limestone and gradually builds it up again. Water is the key to the cycle that has slowly carved the unusual hills and caves of Guilin. Four hundred million years ago, southwestern China was a tropical sea, and on its bed, marine life built thick deposits of limestone. The seabed began to rise, and the limestone appeared on dry land. Disturbances in the Earth's crust caused innumerable fissures in the limestone. Rainwater seeped into these fissures and began to dissolve the rock. Steeply tapered peaks appeared, and the water underground flowed in search of an outlet, carving out the caves. As the water table dropped, 
new caves were carved at deeper levels. For two million years, the water level fell as the steady work of erosion continued. This hole shows the position of an ancient water table. When the level dropped, the dissolved opening to an ancient limestone cave was left high and dry. The water table has lowered still further. Today there's a new cave entrance. A surprising volume of water runs down walls and into the underground river. This is where rainwater seeping into the limestone flows while dissolving the rock and releasing carbon dioxide back into the water. The carbon dioxide content of this water is 10 times higher than normal. In some places, the river flows through narrow channels, while in others, it merges with an intricate maze of underground waterways. Leaving the darkness behind, the river flows back into the world of light. But its journey is not yet complete. It joins with the Li Zhang, like so many other rivers and underground streams in this part of China. As the Li Zhang flows through the countryside, it will be channeled into abundant rice lands, support a wealth of fish within its banks, and carry the boats of travelers and traders. The great store of carbon dioxide, dissolved from the limestone hills of Guilin, travels with the river down to the sea. As the hills slowly wear away, they release the carbon dioxide that was once locked within the shells of sea creatures millions of years ago. This is how carbon dioxide cycles from the atmosphere to the oceans, to the land, and back to the sea again. In the vast blue waters, it is consumed by reef-building marine creatures, which eventually turn it back into limestone on the seabed. This process is one part of a complex carbon cycle which proceeds in the slow rhythm of our planet. Living creatures, water, rock, and atmosphere are linked together in the process that has made our world and keeps the environment in balance. When one link is altered, the whole system may feel the change. Today, a serious threat to the delicate balance of our atmosphere is emerging. We humans are causing a significant increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide, due largely to the burning of fossil fuels like coal and oil to power modern industrialized society. The sea has not been able to keep pace with the increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The long-term results could have a profound impact. Will our world remain temperate or become hot and barren like Venus? The future may depend on our ability to understand and live in harmony with the environmental cycles that begin and end in the sea. Mm -hmm.